when you bring the Bible up to people, the secular people, they go, oh, come on, it's just a book of fairy tales. It's just a whole bunch of book of fairy tales. <laughs> yeah, but I thought you liked fairy tales. Yeah. I thought you liked Marvel. I thought you liked DC. I thought you liked Star Wars. I thought you liked all the... I thought you liked fairy tales. I thought mm -hmm. that's where you wanted to live. Don't you like fantasy? Well, why mm -hmm. wouldn't you like this? Right. Why wouldn't you like these? How come I you mean, don't want to read these? I thought you liked Game of Thrones. Can you right. imagine? Like, the, the amount of... I thought you of, liked <laughs> that stuff. Isn't that what you like? Isn't that yeah. what... I mean, what? So why do? Why are you dismissing this? Is, yeah, yeah, I don't want to... Stay tuned for the show. Poets at War is sponsored by the following. I'm Sarah Levesque, Editor-in-Chief of Logo Sophia Magazine. I would like to invite you to explore our Pilgrim's Journal of Life, Love, and Literature, both in visual format and in podcast format. Our goal is to help bridge the gaps between different Christian denominations and traditions. Please visit our website at logosophiamag.com to read or listen to stories, articles, poetry, and more, all for free. We look forward to journeying with you. Odyssey, I sometimes, you know, something Odyssey, specifically Odyssey related, I'll turn the Odyssey background on. Gotcha. gotcha. Most of the time, I just try to use my office background. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, whatever else there is. That's a that's a little that's a little table right there, and then that's a gate that's supposed to keep the dogs and cats out of my office, but it doesn't uh, really work. I gotcha. I gotcha. I uh... behind me. I wish I had. A, I wish I should have a better background than that, but. I mean, hey, what works, right? <laughs> yep, whatever works, whatever works. Okay, and why in the world? Let me do one more thing here. Uh, preferences. I should be hearing you in my headphones, and I'm not hearing you in my headphones. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Uh, once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Just so you can keep hearing me and decipher whether it goes into your headphones or not. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there we go. A tapping. There we go. That That's, worked. The, it's so funny. I have the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe stuck in my head. Uh, huh. And it's one of those things where I use it as a test phrase when I need to do a longer mic check various yeah. places. As as And it's so funny at um, G3. Are you familiar with those guys? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I worked G3 in 2020. It was right before the pandemic. Uh -huh. And I did that as the, um, I was just doing sound check on one of the mics and it was just so funny. Some of the looks that I got from some of these <laughs> uppity Baptist people, <laughs> they were like, <laughs> why is he saying, so? what is this? It's why really is creepy. Quoting po? <laughs> if they even know who Poe was. <laughs> oh, I'm sure if you told them that that's what it was, they would know, but they wouldn't yeah. know it just to hear it. So, <laughs> and I got into like the third or fourth stanza too. I mean, I, I it was a long mic check, you know, because they were trying <laughs> to really get the EQ dialed in and everything else because yeah. there was a lot of echo in the room, and so it, yeah. was, it was funny. <laughs> it's always it's always fun to play with uh, play with people's sensibilities that way. Oh yeah, and then you know, get mine and... played with. I had a uh, you, you'll like this. Um, are you familiar with the Gettys, Keith and Kristen Getty? Uh no okay they 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 do sort of neo-celtic hymns and okay. stuff like that um they're okay. pretty pretty popular they've been at like the sing conference and other mm -hmm. stuff like that they were at g3 that year and i had a i was i was doing grunt work you know roadie type work behind stage miking people up like vody bacham and paul washer and stuff like that and keith getty comes up and he's going to go on stage and whatever else and um 
little be known to me, the little grunt that never got never gets told anything. He <laughs> has something in his contract that says that he will not have uh, and will not use um, uh, lavalier microphone. Um, oh. Period. He's he's handheld on a stand uh, only. Pretty much, uh, he will do handheld handheld if he's not playing piano. But that's that's his preference. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just told to go lavalier mic him up. And I think this was a, a, a Northern Irish versus <laughs> American thing because he's Northern Irish. Um, I came up and he just acted like stared at me like a deer in the headlights and then proceeded to kind of sort of help me mic him up. But also it was <laughs> like hanging off his ear in a weird way. But I had been close enough to him at this point where it felt like I was physically invading his space. And he goes, OK and just walks out on stage and the sound guy is having a cow what happened blah 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 i'm like my goodness I, <laughs> and they finally figured it out and got a handheld out to him but it was just one of those really like why didn't he say anything to you have right no there? Did clue you not have did you not have handhelds available that you could uh, uh, we did but like he didn't say a word and of course they're not like in his view or anything but i have a feeling it was just like sort of the northern irish passive aggressive i told them this and now they're going to regret it you know kind of a thing um but i don't know for sure ah, i that's that's, just... the, that's the best answer i have because he just looked completely befuddled um <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Well, yeah. I just, I, well, 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 I, I, I suppose I can understand what he would have against lav, lav mics if, if, you know, I mean, he's past. a musician, you know, yeah. so like yeah, in yeah. the past they've done, they've not worked for him. They have popped or they, you know, they, whatever. Uh, so I, I get that, but, but, uh, you know, to not say, um, I'm sorry, do you have a handheld mic available to me or to not tell somebody else to go tell you have a handheld right. mic available? Yeah. It's just well, crazy, but whatever. Yeah, I know. We all have our quirks. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. So I listened to um, your uh, talk with Sarah Levesque of Logo Sophia, and that was uh -huh. quite enjoyable. Oh. Um, she and Ian Wilson and I, I think you know, are kind of sort of a trio on Facebook yeah. at this point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, last time we talked was really fun. We talked about Firefly. We talked about <laughs> keeping the signal going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we, we got into some of that. And when I was hearing her conversation and, and kind of putting together some people I've talked to previously on my show and whatnot, like the big thing that came to mind for me is I would love, cause I always have like, just the first show is just us talking. Mm -hmm. Second show is more topic based, but you know, it can be loose. Um, I was thinking specifically, and I think I told you this, a uh, serial storytelling, Okay. And what the difference is okay. in serial storytelling versus, you know, your standalone stuff, but also just like, how is it a thing? Uh, and why is it a thing? I guess is the other thing. Like, why do people like st serial storytelling? You know, we can get philosophical yeah. about it, that kind of a thing. So, um, do, you have, do you have any thoughts to open up? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, aside from the uh, starting point would be just the things that we probably all know already, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the instincts that we all have or the things that we've heard um, other people say. Um, serials are, uh, they keep you going. They, 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 keep, they keep the cliffhanger going. And we mm -hmm. like that. We like that as human beings. We have an instinctive nature, I think, or an instinctive uh, uh, pleasure in in saying uh oh what's going to happen next oh no you got to tell me you know we we like that uh and, and you're not going to tell me oh i have to wait i have to wait um so there's there's something uh just on a surface that on the surface that's very um pleasant about that pleasant and frustrating at the same time you know right. so it's pleasantly frustrating we we like the idea of of, uh, of an ongoing story we like the idea that somebody's in peril and we hate the idea that, oh, no, I'm going to have to wait to find out what happens next time. <laughs> and it keeps us going. I mean, this is the thing that happens when we were kids. You know, we, we, if, if our parents, if your parents read to you at night stories, 
um, it, would, it was a chapter a night, and you have to we'll have to wait until next time, next to the tomorrow night, to find out what happens. And of course, then it becomes uh, something a bit more for parents. It's an incentive to get you to get into bed. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it, it, if you're having if you have kids who you know you're rambunctious and you want to uh, keep, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> stay awake. <clears throat> And it's hard to get your kids into bed. Well, read them a story and then make it a good one. And if you read it well, they'll they'll get into bed. They'll they'll want to they you know, they'll they'll go out of their way to get into bed. Um, but when you leave the room, they may jump around and you know like wild monkeys. But at least you got them into the bed. Um, but then, if you know, um, if you take it a little bit deeper, theologically deeper. Um, I'm sure that you've heard Doug Wilson and other people say God loves cliffhangers. Yeah. God loves cliffhangers. We are, we, we are creatures uh, of a creator who made us um, to get into situations that um, are of of great peril. And how are we going to get out of this? What are we going to do? And that's, that goes uh, for everything from just day-to-day decisions that, that we have uh, to really life-threatening things, big things, war, um, you know, world conquest, things like that. What's going to happen next? What happens? You know, um, and, and of course, the Old Testament is just a litany of one story like that after another, one, one after another, after another, after another. And, and God apparently loves that because he, <laughs> that's the way he created us. And so I think that, I think that's part of it too. I think that's a big, um, a big part of it that goes right down to the core of our being, the core of our soul, how we're created um, that way. And, and that is also a humongous um, lesson. Mm-hmm. It's a teaching moment for us. Um, I think God in his wisdom knew once the fall happened, um, the best way to teach these creatures of mine who have disobeyed me is to, is to let them get into peril, even put them in peril, Mm-hmm. And then they have to rely on me to get them out of it. They yeah. have to. Um, yeah. and, and, and when they don't, disaster occurs. Yeah. Uh, but, even, but even good can come out of the disaster. And so, um, and I think that, you know, if, if we believe, which I do, that before the foundation of the world, God knew all of this stuff was going to happen. And he uh, set into plan of motion, into, into motion this plan of salvation and how the salvation was going to work. Um, and how how Christ was going to come down. He was going to have to die, and uh, dying is like the 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 end. Mm-hmm. That should have been the end of the story, except <laughs> that he knew it wasn't the end of that's, the story. That's one of the things that, that I always tell people. It's like it's yeah. the greatest cliffhanger ever because ever. not only did it not stop, like it, it, you know, the Marvel. I think um, as for all their stuff they're dealing with now, I yeah. think that's one of the things that they really got right with the end credit like after end credit kind of thing right <laughs> i've always joked that yeah. that's like like jesus rising again is like the ultimate end credit but it actually is the finish of the story it's like yeah. it's a major yeah. fake out you know that, that, that's, <laughs> that's the thing uh, uh i you know it's really it, we think that the story is over because how can you how can you go past death that's it mm-hmm. and uh, can you imagine what those apostles felt in that room for three days Mm-hmm. you know they're all they're all standing or they must have been just devastated the whole time i always wanted to do a three-act play the first mm-hmm. act is day one the second act is day two and the third act is is when the you know the servant girl comes <laughs> they go hey come over here something's happening right uh, you know and they and they all run out and, you know or at least peter you know peter and john run out and, and, uh, and, and what are you crazy i mean this is mm-hmm. this is nuts this is no how could that have, how could that have happened and then and then jesus saying you thought the story was over also, well, does anyone have anything to eat? That was yeah. one of my, that's one of my favorite well, parts. <laughs> anybody got anything to eat? And secondly, you you actually thought the story was over? I mean, don't you don't you know me? I haven't eaten in three I, days. You got I, some food. <laughs> I, I spilled the wind and the waves. I walked on water. I mm-hmm. did. Don't you know me? I I fed five thousand people with you know a couple of loaves of bread and some fish. Um, don't 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 you know me by now? I mean mm-hmm. that kind of is what he was telling Thomas. Don't you know me? Don't you right. know this? Don't you know what's going on? You know, mm-hmm. blessed are the people who are not here to see me and still believe. That's right. that's what's great. That's what's really wonderful. So, um, and 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 thank God he, you know, thank God he's installed instilled instilled that in us that we mm-hmm. do have this belief that the story is so incredible 
that we do believe it. We we have the sense of story. This goes. This is all ties into what you know. My story story is everything. Kind of, uh, you know, th- th- it all ties into that. Uh, we have this sense of story. We are all living, walking, talking stories. And and what's the great thing about stories? Cliffhangers. I mean, that's, right. That's that's our lives. You know. And yeah. again, it goes it goes down to every little single minute decision that we make. We can be in in. It, it could be just. I have, oh, I'm in the horns of a dilemma. Do I pay this bill or that bill? Uh, which seems like a big thing at the time, but in retrospect, it's like, well, you, you forgot about that. I did this. But each choice that you make, obviously, is a big cliffhanger. But of course, the irony of all this is, uh, one, there's one ironic thing about all of this too, is that uh, in storytelling, for us, when we write stories, we like to stay away from the deus ex machina ending. God rescue us. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's exactly, I mean, that is the story of Jesus. Right. We're, we're hopelessly doomed and God has to come down and rescue us. We've gotten ourselves out on the cliff and there's no place to go. And the enemy is marching right at us and, right. uh, you know, and about to devour us. And now what do we do? You right. Know, uh, it seems like the great storyteller has written us into a corner. Right. You know, we can't get out of this corner. Now what? And then the great storyteller does the absolute impossible. Yeah, the uh, the, the, the the deeper magic from beyond the dawn of yes, time. There's yes. a deeper magic yes. going on here, and and that's what's wonderful about uh, about that whole uh, story for Aslan. Uh, you know, there's the witch thinks it's over. This is it. I've right. won. Yay! Look at the story, and everybody else does too. The kids all think that we're done. That's it. It's all. It's yeah. over. Yeah. Um there's a guy um uh named jason farley who i'm friends with i don't know if you've seen some of his stuff or not but um he uh was did recently did a show with uh david shannon chocolate knox on um they've been going through dante mm-hmm. um knox's uh uh dante's inferno um knox has not read it and he's trying to kind of give himself sort of the literary education he never had and yeah. jason's helping him along the way um and Jason's just the person because he was a, uh, a, uh, atheistic kid raised in a PC USA church who suddenly when he became, you know, a Christian basically just hid away in a library for like five years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, he, um, he's, he's really intelligent when it comes to this kind of thing. And they were talking, he was talking about specifically how you used to have this old idea of comedy and tragedy not comedy of course like humor for our listeners uh not humorous but comedy as in a happy ending versus a sad ending basically is what it amounts to um and so uh a big thing that got changed around with shakespeare and some of the other people after christ came is we now have the category of a tragic comedy or a comedic tragedy. Um, and, and we have a situation, especially in a tragic comedy where, you know, like Jesus, the main character dies, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but then comes back. Yeah. Um, and there's all kinds of variations like that, like um, Dorothy uh, uh, trying to get home. Uh, she didn't get home the way she expected, you know, right. there, there's, there's all these different, uh turns of turns of fortune you know there's a tragic that turns into a comedy like with finding nemo as an example for people who want to go into that but this is one of those things like then this is going to get really kind of out there real quick but i'll just say this very briefly that's one of those things that i'm most looking forward to on the other side of glory whether it's you know um i'm post mill but the 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 other side of you know the new heavens and the new earth actual you know culmination Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. just heaven yeah i know story structure is going to change and unfold in a way that it's it's going to be different than what i know now sure um and and that excites me because i can see the change from before and after christ yeah. that's where we get deus ex machina and quite frankly it is literally unpleasing now to have gods intervene in a way that's just like oh you went, came all this way hero and now because that's really what yeah. they were talking about when they say yeah. deus ex machina right um but like ne- when you think of it as um tolkien used the word um the uh oh what was the word the catastrophe um, yeah the catastrophe and um i love that word so much yeah, I do too. he had to, uh, he had to create it because he didn't have a word 
to describe it. Right. You know, and, it, and it was it was for the fairy tales. I, I, we don't have a word to describe this. We created one, which is, he, of course, his his media. He loved doing that. He loved yeah. creating words. And it's a great word. It's a fantastic mm-hmm. word. Yeah. But that's that's kind of what I was I, I'm thinking. The, one of the other things that I wanted to throw this at you and see what you thought. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, one of the things that really hits me and Tolkien kind of goes about it one way and Lewis goes about it another. Um, Tolkien goes about not just the cliffhanger, but the world building, right? Yeah. He's really big into the world building mm-hmm. and creating something that is so intricately detailed as to imitate real life. Yeah. Lewis, on the other hand, even though he only wrote seven Narnia books and had that whole letter about feeling like a tap that just ran out of water, um, which feels like i just think he wanted to write other things and be oh, sure. <laughs> but, I, but done. I i don't think he did hadn't didn't have any more narnia stories i don't think that's real <laughs> yeah. but um the point being that last battle kind of goes about it in a way where um the idea is you know further up and further in mm-hmm. and i think because we're created as immortal souls that will be, you know, immortal (laughs) that will continue to live on. We want things in this world, including stories instinctually to be infinite and they're not, but a serial is as about as close as we can get. Yeah. uh, And I think that we can see in a serial uh, that we create, um, why, uh, why it shouldn't, <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, there are times when we're, we're dragging out a cereal and mm-hmm. we've long since run out of steam and, and, and then you just, find new steam later going. on. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, okay, stop this. Let's, let's, we, we should have stopped this a long, long time ago. I mean, we have all seen, uh, like television shows that we really like that are going on and on and on. And like this, this stopped being funny a long time ago. This, this whole series just stopped being intriguing a long time ago. Um, and so, and so we don't know how to make that interesting right? because we're flawed creatures. We know how to make it interesting for a while. Mm-hmm. But we don't. We we oftentimes don't don't have the sense to say, okay, now we're done. Right. We're done. Right. We're going to move on to something else. We're going to do something else. Um, and maybe maybe Lewis was a little bit smarter than you know was was smart in that sense about <laughs> saying to, about Narnia, we're done. No, you know, we're going to move on. If well, I, I mean, we, Tolkien didn't if uh, do this uh, again. If I do another one of these, it probably is not going to be as good. It's not going to be good for me. It's not going to be right. good for everybody else. Everybody wants Susan to come back into Narnia. That's what right. they all want. They're hoping for one more. They're, oh. they're hoping for one more <laughs> book. Can we have one more story that <laughs> just brings her back? But you know, I look at that um, and say. And I said this. I said this much to the consternation of many of the of the fans of of Odyssey and and some of the other work that I've done. Not all characters are created to be redeemed. That's true. Yes. You know, not all characters have a redemption story. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are who contact me or they'll post online and say, "Wouldn't it be great if Rodney Rathbone came back and he was a Christian?" And he's a youth pastor now, and he married right. Donna Barkley, and they're right, all right, right. happy, happy, happy <laughs> together, and everything. And then he has this great, great time. And, and, and like, they're usually like overly happy. And I'm like, ideas. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's probably one of the worst ideas I've ever. <laughs> I've heard Rodney is not created to be redeemed. Now Richard right. Maxwell, well, you know, maybe yes. Richard Maxwell, but I wouldn't put him in that kind of a story necessarily. Right. But 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 there are characters that are created to be redeemed. There are characters that are not created to be redeemed. You right. Don't, you, you don't. You don't redeem Bart Rathbone unless you really don't want Bart Rathbone around anymore. Right. Uh, this is what I'm trying to get across to to folks about, you know, we're getting way off topic here, but about about Connie getting married. It's this fine. Is, it's gonna change her it's gonna change her, her Oh, whole absolutely. Character. Absolutely. It will change everything about her. Everything that you love about Connie will necessarily change because she's married. And the only reason to change Connie is if you actually come up with something that is better. Well, and I, I, you may I, or may not actually have an incentive to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, and I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, 
uh, the conditions under which I would say Connie could get married. And and right. I think those conditions would probably not be what people are looking for. Right. I think a lot of people are looking for a real romantic, um, lovely. No, that's not Connie. Style that, and I'm like, you, okay. So already you have a different character than what Connie is already. Yes. Yes. And, and, uh, and if, if that's what you're looking for, that's really not, that's really not going to happen. This, or, this... or you'll wonder why this isn't working. It's it's so funny you mentioned that. When I see a lot of the stuff specifically with Connie, um I very quickly in my brain go, you know, obviously you have and you're you're the most important in this situation. I say most important as in like you're the only one's going to be really changing a lot of that. You and maybe a few other people, but um Oh, I'm I, just one voice of many. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> and but, not even the deciding one. So, oh, and you know, I know. I know people decide. I know, I know. But with that hands. with that being said, um the the one thing that I think of like it, this is completely thematic and abstract, but like Connie is not a um a giant diamond ring wedding person. Yeah. Connie is like what me and my wife have. This is a stainless steel polarized ring. We both have yeah. one of these. And yeah. we specifically chose stainless steel because even though we do love each other and we have all, you know, wonderful, wonderful relationship, the fact is we agreed very early on not to be precious about the relationship in a meta sort of way. Yeah. And we not only were we going to have stainless steel rings for that purpose, but it, we don't break right we, yeah. we, that that's the whole point it's not some kind of super precious soft metal like gold it's something yeah. that will not break yeah. you know um and that's that's more of what i would see would have to happen with connie you know because well, of who I, she I, is you know one of the things that people love about connie is her independence and her strong-willed nature mm -hmm. i mean she's a, a very independent and strong-willed person marriage has got to change that yes you know, she's got to be submissive. Mm -hmm. If she's going to be have, a, if she's going to have a scriptural marriage, she's going to have, she's going to be submissive. So, uh, you know, I look at this and say, where would we go with that? Right. What would we do with that? Now, that may be interesting for a while. Um, but can you keep but, that going? Is but, it going to mess with Odyssey's engine? Right. So, yeah. so what? What do we do? You know, either one of two paths is going to take. If we take the comical path, then it's I love Lucy. Yeah, and people might go. Okay, well, that's great. Let's do. I you already Lucy. have that though with Wooten well, we and Penny, yeah. and we already have. Yeah, that. yeah, you already um, have that. And and then the other path is going to be the path of of tragedy. It's going to be. Yeah, she's going to. She's going to. Um, she's going to mirror her folks, her own parents' marriage. It's going yeah. to be the kind of thing that you know. And so, and maybe there's good stories in that. Maybe maybe there's something to 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 do with that. But um, and. But like I said, you know, it's it's a, it's going to essentially change her character. If we do right. anything like that, it necessarily will change her character. Yeah. And I, I think people don't realize how much it will change her character and it will have to. Yeah, absolutely. And and, uh, and so, you know, <laughs> the, the Connie and Jason, Connie and Jason. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Not unless you want them both to be profoundly unhappy. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> if you want them to be unhappy, then oh, you know, let's but we'll do we'll do we'll we'll marry them together for a couple of days and then once they their personalities we'll do an eye slap floor. <laughs> right. Their personalities will kick in, their natural personalities will kick in and they'll be miserable and then we'll go, Oh, why did we do this? You know. So Yeah, because everyone was so happy with Mitch. <laughs> <sighs> uh. Uh, uh, <laughs> yep i know it i know it man oh man but uh <laughs> yeah so um not so much oh oh okay i had the you mentioned <clears throat> um there was something that you mentioned that really made me like pop up because there was something i had to tell you let me see if i can remember um we we're talking about connie we we're talking about that Ah, if it comes back to me, it will. Um, okay. One thing that, um, you know, we were talking about the uh, the resurrection and how that is our pr kind of prototypical cliffhanger. Yeah. That is one of the biggest differences I see. Um, and this isn't just complimenting like 
I would love if you actually went into craft on it, if you had anything. And I know it's been forever since this one, but the first Odyssey episode I ever listened to was the Imagination Station part one and two. Yeah. I got one of the classics albums uh, when I was getting, uh, in my mom's opinion, too old for the Donut Man I, all the time. <laughs> I needed something a little bit more mature. Um, and uh, she... Uh, that's, a, I, that's a good mom. That's yeah, a good well, mom. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I love Rob Evans to this day, and I really oh, hope that... I have no, nothing yeah. against the Donut Man. It's just yeah, yeah. That that's a good mom to know yes. that you're... Yes. That you're, you're you're entering into a new phase now and you need something a little I've bit reached more. out to him. I'd love to have him on here too. Cause his, sure. his the, 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 when I was a homeschool kid uh, doing the thing, the homeschool was another thing I wanted to mention. Cause I had listened to the episode. Uh, if you know what I'm talking about just oh, recently, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. the, uh, the thing that I remember most about kind of just what formed the very early theology of my life yeah. was, um, listening to donut man and odyssey tapes in the car with my mom because she would run around and not just run errands but she had some clients that she did paperworky kind of stuff for mm -hmm. uh as a side job um okay. growing up and um we would go you know 30 minutes here 30 minutes there we would listen to this listen to that and i remember a lot of my theology being uh shaped by you know, Donut Man's more overt preaching style and especially the lyrics of uh, still to this day can't get over the God's Army album. If you've ever yeah. heard that, that one is I, fantastic. I've not heard it. It's all right. Um, just really awesome lyrics. And none of the other kids shows were doing it where you'd sing something like there's a great and mighty army in the earth today dressed in splendid armor there in full array. The host of darkness tremble when we walk their way, you know, that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's all marchy and kids are singing a chorus whatever but it's like the lyrics are really biblically intense you know sure sure um but then uh imagination station getting into the the craft of that that that's one of those things those it's one of the few adaptations of the resurrection story that i think emphasizes the cliffhanger yeah. more than many others many others is just like we're we all know what we're getting to so let's just walk through the steps uh, you know as opposed yeah. to really you know i still get choked up when i hear digger crying out you know and everything i still do and, yeah. and digger to this day is one of those characters that i really wish we got more of <laughs> i love yeah. digger dig willow so yeah yeah uh, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I was going to say about Odyssey, um, not, not Odyssey in particular, uh, but what we tried to do with Odyssey and, um, and how it relates to scripture. Um, and I've thought a lot about this lately, especially, um, but we, we, um, we have a default these days to thinking that really good stories or, or the, the, the bent of the culture is toward superhero stories. Mm -hmm. You know, we like the comic book stories and we like the, the, um, uh, the, all the superheroes and their different, different things and, 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 uh, and, and the Marvel movies and the, and whatever, you know, the DC comic movies and whatever you feel about those things. Star Wars and everything else. Well, yeah. you know, anything but the supernatural element. To it. Yeah. We like the supernatural. We want, we want to, the, we hope the force is real and the things that, things like that. And we ignore this book that we have where stuff like that really happened. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> where, where we have, uh, uh, you know, we have the, the, the guy who threw the piece of wood on the ground, the stick on the ground, and it turns into a serpent. And then the, the first other wizard's there, duel. You know. Yeah, 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 exactly. The, mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. The first wizard's duel. And we have, we have uh, a guy who who calls out to heaven and fire comes down and drinks up uh, an altar of rocks and and uh, animal flesh and wood that's soaking wet with 12 barrels of water mm -hmm. on it and it, it's dry as a bone mm -hmm. you know um, we have a stories of uh, three guys who were thrown into a furnace that was so hot it killed the guys throwing them in. 
Mm-hmm. That these guys were touched. We we have we have these stories. They're there. They're all there. They're right there. And we don't. Uh, you know, this the guy who who uh, who killed a lion with his bare hands. Mm-hmm. We have that story, and, and that really happened. Mm-hmm. It, it really happened. Um, it, it may be a story that happened so that we could learn a deeper lesson. Mm-hmm. Okay, all all of those have all of those stories are also metaphors for something deeper, but but it doesn't erase the fact that all of those things really happened. Right. And, why we why we dismiss those as fairy tales is beyond me i mean it really it really is it really i think it's because we've seen we've we've heard them so much they've become cliched and so we don't really think about how profound they are right we don't really think about how uh, real they are and maybe the comic book side of us now has lessened the reality of the real things and the I, other, yeah, and the, I and have, I have this, I have this, I, I point this out in the, I, I, in the, the young, the, the fifth young wit is a preview of the fifth young wit book that will be coming out next year, and we have a character who points this out to to some to to young wit and to some other characters too. These things really happened. These things really really happened, and because and because we want the these comic book characters because we like them so much, or we like this, we like the movie myth you know, and the comic book myth and stuff. We ignore the miracles around us every day. We we ignore the magic, if you will, of everyday life and, and the stuff that really happens. We see an airplane go by and we don't think anything of it. But but there are 120 or 200 people in an iron tube or in, in a metal tube mm-hmm. flying across the air, mm-hmm. flying, in, flying great distances, mm-hmm. you know, now people say, "Yeah, well, that's just science." Well, well, wait a minute. Have we have we forgotten <laughs> the fact that they're flying through the air? Both they're evangelical, flying. yeah. It, both you know? e- both your basic evangelicalism of the West yeah. and your scientism of the yeah. West, yeah, make the fatal flaw of thinking too that theirs is the only power of any sort whatsoever. Right. And we we not only do we not see Elijah and Moses and all these other stories that you reference, but we also don't see the fact that the Zoroastrians, the Jehovah's Witness of the Old Testament, let's just yeah. be real here, right? They yeah, were they right. were a a a Christian Christian Judeo Christian adjacent cult, right? Um, right. They they looked at the stars. Yeah. And knew that the king of the universe was born. Right. Right. Uh, they, they read the stars as a newspaper and knew yeah. what was going on. Yeah. And then we also have, you know, you know, we, we only bring that up because it's in the nativity set. But yeah. we have we have no references whatsoever. And man, regardless of how the interpretation ended up, I don't think you all ever did a, 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 an adaptation. But man, would I love even just an OT action news sort, sort of quick thing um, on uh, the seance <laughs> of 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 samuel and that whole oh situation, yeah yeah, you know yeah. I, mean? you know, I i actually did uh write that into a play mm-hmm. for the continentals they did a musical about david and, and nice saul and, saul and whatnot and um uh, i wrote the book for it and uh and that was uh, that was such an interesting experience to write um first of all saul con- you know saul uh consulting the witches the, mm-hmm. the witch to bring back sin you know all of that whole that the way that whole thing worked out was so interesting and so strange mm-hmm. and it's just and samuel is so curmudgeonly yeah. you know when he when he it's like why did you why what why did you call me back i was i was happy i you know i was peaceful <laughs> whatever are you bringing me back here what's wrong with you it's like the <laughs> ultimate you know jewish dad <laughs> yeah yeah ragging on him what's wrong with you I, you, you, you were, can almost hear was, the billy crystal exactly, i never worked for so little exactly i was mean, so when i was alive you didn't do what you were supposed to do and now <laughs> i'm dead and you still are after me what's <laughs> can i get any peace from you you know uh so but it's it it was uh it's uh, yeah i would i i'd love to do that there are a lot of things that we haven't done in, in in scripture that i would really love to be able to do i don't know that we could do them on odyssey but maybe there's a separate uh 
you know, if we got radio theater going, I, I would actually really love to do one of the things I'd love to do for like a radio theater um, is the book of judges mm -hmm. and do it really graphically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, make sure it's, it's graph. It's, it's, it's completely uh, correct. Yeah. And how, and how everything, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to soft pedal anything where, you know, where, when you hear a state going through somebody's head, it's going through their head. When you hear a big fat man taking a dump, he's really taking a dump. You know? <laughs> when you hear all of those things happening, uh, you know, they're really happening. And, uh, and I think it would be great to do that kind of a, of a treatment of it. Cause if you read that, when you, when you read through the book of judges, it is, it is horrifying. Some of the things right. that happen. Yeah. Some of the things that happen in there are just simply so the worst of the worst of like uh, non non again non supernatural horror films, but just films about people who are. That's the superhero bad. book of the Bible, right there. Oh, if there is goodness. one, yeah, it's it, it it's stunning how how graphic these tales are, um, and but we again we just we just kind of float over them because we've read them so many times and we've done so much stuff with them and. We just don't really think about it. And we that. avoid the places that are hard. Uh, one, of, uh, yeah, one of my favorite, hard yeah. one, of, one of my favorite things to do for evangelical crowds, um, storytelling wise, um, and even Catholic crowds yeah. <laughs> is, uh, the, um, uh, well, I have a rhyming sort of outlaw country version, uh, poetry <laughs> version of, uh, Ehud called the ballad of Ehud. Yeah. Uh, and then the oh, yeah. other one is, um, just actually reading some, some of song of Solomon straight up. Oh yeah. Because I mean, you can't argue that some of those beautiful poetry ever yeah. and people here, here's my big thing with song of Solomon. Um, regardless of this theological implications, the principle I think is, is sound, um, yeah that we have a book that tells us what marital love should be mm -hmm. in beautiful poetical form. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why we have a porn problem <laughs> in America. Yeah. Because we're not preaching song of Solomon. Right. We're right. not, you right. know, now, now what, what, what you, th where you think you have to go with that and what this, that, and the other, but the fact is your children, I don't believe there's an, I don't believe there's anything in scripture that any child cannot take at any age. Um, yeah. That's what I believe. I know a lot of people disagree with that, but like, that's what I believe. And, you know, I well, have no problem well, explaining these things well, to my kids. It goes a little, yeah, it goes back to uh, something that's more foundational. And that is um, meditate on this day and night. Talk about this when you get up and when you go to bed, when you're going out of your house and when you're coming into your house, talk to this with your children. Talk. This is what God's command to us was, yep. to command to the Jews, mm -hmm. was you meditate on this all the time, all and, the time. You and talk even, about it yeah. all the time, all the time. There's a great uh, series that's on Netflix. Yes, I do have a subscription to Netflix. That's fine. <laughs> but there's a, there's a great series that I really like on Netflix. Uh, it's only three seasons. It's a, a series called Stitzel. Okay. And it's from Israel. It's an Israeli series. And it's about a, a family of Orthodox Jews. The patriarch of the family runs a Hebrew school, and his son is trying to find his way in life. Um, but they have the they have the whole, you know, curly hair hair thing. They they're they're strictly Orthodox, wear their yarmulke they all, all the time. And the son is an artist and he's a really talented artist. And of course, he has to walk this real fine line about his art because uh, thou shalt not make any graven images. Right. So he has to be really, really careful what he's doing in order to stay orthodox because he does want to do that. But they have uh, they have several children in the family, and it's just the uh, some of the ins and outs, and it's it, it's really wonderful scripting to show what this family is like in a modern world and what they have to do in order to to maintain their orthodoxy. Um, their orthodox status and and one of the interesting things about it was um, a storyline i'm going to i'm going to do a spoiler here so Go ahead. Spo spoiler alert mm -hmm. uh, one of the storylines was the one of the grandchildren got married and 
she wants to have children really badly. That's one of the things that they, the Orthodox Jewish women really want. And, but she has a heart problem. She has a genetic heart problem and uh, having children um, will be very dangerous for her. And so her husband um, and Orthodox men uh, spend all day long studying. That's all they do is they read the Torah, they read the Talmud, mm-hmm. they study, they study, they study, they study, and they study, and they, they depict it really well in this where they get into big school rooms and they're, all, they're you know, 30, 40 guys in a room and they're all just reading out loud the, the scripture. They're reading it out loud, reading it out loud, meditating, reading it out loud, reading it out loud. And they do this eight or eight or 10 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And um, so they're, they're investigating um, for this young couple what the possibility, what their op- options are. What are what are uh-huh. our options if she can't have a baby because she lost one early on in their in their marriage and nearly killed her. Mm-hmm. And so they're investigating what they could do. And one of the options that they come across is uh, surrogate parenting. Mm-hmm. So um, they're going to take his his sperm, her egg, and put it in another woman. And the husband has a real problem with this. Because mm-hmm. apparently he's not, he can't find anything about it in the Torah. Uh, uh, he's not sure it's or, or orthodox. He's not sure it's scriptural. He's not sure that this is something he should be doing. It's a real problem. And they go through a lot of twists and turns and everything. And, um, and, and, and they're finally deciding that they're going to go ahead and do this. Um, and she will, she will uh, go along with the pretense so she has these fake bellies that she puts on that makes her look a little bit bigger every, you know, every two or three months, she looks bigger and bigger. And then they have it all worked out where they'll go to the hospital with a surrogate and they'll come home with a baby and nobody will be the wiser. Everybody will be okay. Nobody will be the wiser. Well, they have a little twist in the story where the, the, the wife decides I'm not going to do it that way. Mm-hmm. I'm actually going to really have a baby really get pregnant and and that's of course the big shocker nobody she can't tell no everybody thinks she's just wearing these fake pillows everybody who knows is just thinks that she's wearing these fake you know bellies <clears throat> and then she finally tells her husband and her husband is just livid he's just so mad why didn't you tell me how come you didn't tell me don't you understand i really I, this is really hard this is really scary i don't know this is bad this is bad you you've you've shaken me to my core i'm scared to my core right now because of what's going on here with this and she's she doesn't know and she's well along into the pregnancy and 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 nothing bad has happened yet but you know it it could happen at any time so he goes to his his uh master the head of his school and he and the rabbi and he he asks him about this he confesses the whole thing to him he says this is what's going on and I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do. And the wonderful thing about this series is that there are times when things like that happen. You're on the horns of a dilemma, and they go to their they, they go to their religious folks, they go to their people. And and the rabbinic wisdom that comes out of these guys is just amazing. It's part Socrates and part um, psychology. Yeah. And it's really interesting. It's really, really interesting. And in this instance, he said, Well, what do you think you should do? So there's the there's the the psychology and part Socrates asking questions, and he says, "I, I really don't know what to do. I'm, I I I don't I can't think of what to do. I don't I can't I don't know. I have to. I know I'm going to have to tell her parents. I know I'm going to have to. We're going to have we're going to have to. This is just bad. I don't know. Right. This is even something that should go should happen." And he says, "You need to." He said, "You're a the rabbi says you're a scholarly young man. I know that you're a scholar." And I know that you love the Torah, and I know that you love the Talmud. Um, you need to dig to, to, to dig deeper. You need to delve into the into the into the Torah. You need to delve into the law. De- delve into the Word. Jump deeper into it, deeper and deeper and deeper. And I assure you that when you do that, you will find the answer. Mm-hmm. And he said, "But I have to tell her folks this afternoon." Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't have a lot of time now. It's it's almost that time. And he said, he says rabbinically, there is a long path that is short, and there's a short path that is long. And he says, an hour reading, two hours reading, your problems will still be there, but at least you'll have an hour, two hours reading. And so he does. He goes in. They depict this. He goes in. 
He sits down, he starts reading, he starts reading, he starts meditating, he starts meditating, and he comes across a verse, and suddenly his eyes are opened. He realizes this is it. This is this is it. I I got it. That's right. That's good. That's right. And I won't even tell you what the verse is, but he goes back and he has a really touching scene with his wife. And she says, you're not afraid anymore? He says, no, absolutely, I'm afraid. I'm scared to death. I'm afraid. But we're going to keep praying, and we'll be afraid together. And That's then right. we'll have a baby. And we'll have a baby. It'll be a boy or a girl. And we'll keep praying and being afraid together. And when that baby crosses the street, grows up and crosses the street, we'll be afraid for that baby. But we'll keep praying and, and being afraid together. And when any event happens, we'll be afraid but we'll be afraid together. We'll be afraid and we'll keep praying together. And it's such a wonderful, wonderful way of looking at Scripture. And I'm, and I'm thinking, we've lost that in, in our evangelical world. We've lost that in, in a lot of our Protestant world. We've lost that idea. You know, so circling back around to how this whole thing started, when, what we were talking about, you know, reading Scripture should never be something we're afraid of. Reading scripture to our children as it's laid out should never be something that we're afraid of, and we should meditate on it. And when we don't have the answer, when we're facing a dilemma, there's a surface answer that we can have, and that's a problem because if we take the surface answer, chances are it's not going to work, and then we're going to say, see, scripture doesn't work at all. No, the answer is dig deeper, right. dig deeper, go deeper, delve, dive into it, grapple with it. Go yep. deeper, 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 deeper. And that's and, and and that's something we don't like to do. It's too hard. Right. That's too hard. But I agree with this rabbi who said, I assure you, you will find the answers to your problems. Yep. And then when you think about it, you think, of course, this is God's word. Mm -hmm. This is the creator of the universe's book to us. Mm -hmm. this is his words and then of course you've got all the people yeah but they're interpreted this way and they're blah 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 that way and how do we know <laughs> it's the right thing and i think you're just making excuses yep delve deep into it deeper go deeper and you'll find the answers the answers are there dig deeper and it sounds so cliched and it sounds and, it, and it's like the stories it's like the great stories that we're talking about they all sound so cliched because we've had it we've heard them they're around all the time they're all the time. We're they're around, and of course, for society, uh, TV preachers have just ruined Christianity for the rest of society because you know they've they've twisted it into whatever they want to twist it into, into the bad stuff that they're twisting into. And thank God for somebody like a Jordan Peterson who comes back to us and says, "Hey, there's a lot more going on here than you realize." Right. So we're going to do some lectures on this, and I'm going to talk about this for two or three hours one night on a Tuesday. And anybody who wants to come and listen to me talk can come, and thousands of people join in and right. listen to him talk because he's delving deeper. He's digging deeper. There's more right. to it than that. And you can find the answers you're looking for. And he calls it, of course, meaning. Meaning. It's all about meaning. That's what we're looking for. Well, we're missing it. It's right there. It's right there. We just yeah. have to keep looking for it. Why do we why do we just throw it away when that's where we should be looking? That's exactly where we should be looking. It's so amazing to us that uh, I mean that'll be the great <laughs> if we ever have in, in in like you said in the in the beyond the next life, uh, we ever get to look at the big projector of the sky that's projecting our lives. One of the big things we're gonna all do is go head slap, you know, face palm, yeah. good grief. It was right there all along, and all yeah. we did was ignore it. Yeah. You know, all we did was... Just, uh, and the same people who said, why would... This is the other irony, the big irony I was going to get to as well, was the idea of when you bring the Bible up to people, the secular people, they go, oh, come on, it's just a book of fairy tales. It's just a whole bunch of <laughs> book of fairy tales. Yeah, but I thought you liked fairy tales. Yeah. I thought you liked Marvel. I thought you liked DC. I thought you liked Star Wars. I thought you liked all the, I thought you liked fairy tales. I thought mm -hmm. that's where you wanted to live. Don't you like fantasy? Well, why mm -hmm. wouldn't you like this? Right. Why wouldn't you like these? How come I you mean, don't want to read these? I thought you liked Game of Thrones. Can you right. imagine? Like the, the amount of. I thought you of, liked of... that stuff. Isn't that what you like? Isn't that yeah. what I did? What? So why do, why are you dismissing this? Is, uh, I don't want to, uh, what are you afraid? 
I think it is. I think it's the fact yeah. that they're afraid. They don't want to delve into it. And and then the other part of it, of course, is that it's hard. Mm -hmm. This is not easy stuff. This is hard. And we want to make it out to be easy. We want to make and you know, okay, so a certain thing about it is, is very, all you have to do is say this, and all you have to do is say that and everything. And then, but what did Jesus say about that? He told a whole parable about it. S seed that lands on different kinds of soil. You know, seed that lands on different kinds of soil where where you know, sometimes it springs up really fast and it's very enthusiastic and we love it. Yay, yay, yay. And then because it's got no roots, it fades away, choked right. off by weeds, the cares of the world, you know, blown away, eat, eaten by birds, eaten by, you know, taken away completely. Don't, don't have a chance to even grow at all. And then, of course, the good soil, the good soil, which is hard. It's hard to do that stuff. It's got to go deep dig deeper dig deeper and i assure you the answers are there so yeah. i mean that's that's the sermon for tonight i guess but, <laughs> i loved it i loved it's it just, but... it's just it's just it's it, when you come across something like this and this is what i love about story when you come across something like this is so profound and and it's real it, it, it really is kind of obvious it's been around for a long time it's been around uh, you know right in front of us the whole time but when I think that's that's uh, the nature of really good storytellers. They'll take things that are right in front of us and tell it in a way that makes us go, oh, my goodness, yes, of course, of course. That's exactly right. Of course, that's what we should be doing. Um, yeah. So anyway, I highly recommend Schnitzel. Uh, watch, watch. How's that spelled for people who are looking? S-H-T-I-S-E-L. Okay. S-H-T-I-S-E-L. And cool. if you go on Netflix, it's on, it's on there. It's um, three, three, uh, three seasons worth of it. That's awesome. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's very exasperating. You'll watch it and you go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> then there are other times when there's so much wonderful uh, wonderful storytelling going on. In fact, it, I'll tell you that now. I won't tell you what it is, but the beginning of season three, uh, this doesn't happen to me very often. The beginning of season three, there was a moment that I literally went. Yeah. <laughs> I did not see that coming at all. Yeah, there's a there's a real literal jaw dropping moment at the beginning of season three, um, but that's all I'll say because I, I want everybody to experience it on their own. That's uh, wonderful. So yeah. yeah, it's it's great when stuff like that happens and you find it. You really you know it's like the pearl of great price. You know, sell everything, tell it, tell everybody about it, have them go experience it on their own. Yeah, you know. You talking about that, I think that, you know, obviously there are these mind-blowing moments for any Christian who delves into the Bible. The yeah. biggest one for me has always kind of been, and this is very hard to describe fully, but I'll try and do it very shortly, um, the meta narrative of the Melchizedekian king, mm -hmm. meaning he's not just a Jewish savior. Right. He's actually a universal savior that saved the sons of Noah. Yeah. Um, that whole arc is something that so few people see because so few people really actually read Hebrews. <laughs> um, but beyond that kind of idea, the, the, the mind blowing, you delve deep and you find this incredible treasure. The, I think the incentive for that, you know, gets washed up when we there's there's two there's two ways that i've seen people do this they've either oversimplified or they've uh overcomplicated the yeah. scripture yeah. um the oversimplification goes just the gospel just the gospel that's all you need is the gospel you don't need adam and eve you don't need judges you don't need you know all this other kind of stuff and then the other aspect is when they overcomplicate and they talk about you know knowing uh, somehow knowing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin is going to absolutely <laughs> change your life right? right right um the way my father whether knowingly or not went about incentivizing me to read scripture um was not some pragmatic approach and it was not um you know some some little trick that he did to get his kids to read what he did was he went to, I remember two of them most vividly, but he would look for the passages of scripture that awakened his heart the most. Yeah. And the two I remember the most, 
um, and really changed the way I look at scripture from a very young age were Psalm 19, specifically the passage where it speaks about the law of the Lord Lord is perfect, uh, converting the soul and then saying, uh, better, better is it to be prized above gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the, and the honeycomb. Mm-hmm. And when my dad read that, he, he wept because he yeah. was telling his son how absolutely beautiful this is. He yeah. wasn't talking about all the delving I would have to do to find it. Right. He was talking about this is what it has done for me. And my dad didn't cry. You know what I'm saying? But he sure. cried with this. Yeah. yeah. And then the other one that he constantly told me, and this is giving me specifically something about Jesus is the wedding of Cana. Mm. He said, Jesus didn't just turn the water into wine. He turned it into the finest wine a veteran wine taster had ever had. It possibly was the greatest, and he he believes it was, the greatest wine to ever exist at a little backyard wedding in Cana. Yeah. (laughs) The, The audacity of doing such a thing just because of how good he is. Yeah. Just because of how good he and his father are. Yeah. Is yeah. is just mind blowing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um and yeah. see that's that's delving. That's mm-hmm. digging deeper. That's yep. understanding that. That's mm-hmm. not just um that's not just um skimming over the surface right. events of the story. That's making you understand for just a minute and 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 stopping and thinking about what the implications of what right. he did are. Yeah. Yep. What is that? And then and then of course it, it goes even deeper than that. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can delve into about about why why those pots, mm-hmm. why yep. why that wine, why mm-hmm. that water, why at a wedding, why at a wedding, mm-hmm. yeah, why at a wedding, whose wedding was it? Right. <laughs> no. Why did why did he tell Mary it wasn't his time, even though yeah, it was very why, shortly after? Why? Yeah. Why did he even have the conversation with his mother at all? Why is um, that in the Bible? Why is that there? <laughs> yeah. Why is that even there? Why is it? Wh- right. There must be some, but we don't ask these questions. Right. We don't. We we it, they're too hard. Mm-hmm. We don't like that. We don't. Why do we have to? Can we just say he did it? And that's like, can't we just turn miracle. our brains off? And uh, yeah, what's well, yeah. the first miracle? And that's what we need. And we need to know that he's a guy who can do miracles and isn't that great? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> you can do that. That's that's a fine. You know, that's great. At least you're acknowledging that. That's perfectly fine. But it's not going to help you. You know, uh, there's much more to it than that. And if you dig deeper, you'll find a greater meaning. Yep. Um, and that's that is really, I think, the type of thing that we want to put into our stories, you know, to to bring it back to Odyssey, to bring it back to even the Imagination Station. Um, you know, it, it, it. I don't know that uh, that Paul McCusker and I, in writing those those two episodes in particular, uh, at 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 that age, the age that we were, which were considerably younger than we are now. Let's just right. put it that way. Uh, had the wisdom to know what what we wanted, what we could have done, or what we could, what we should do with that story. Um, we understood the profundity of the story itself. That's one thing, but I think we were more interested in getting this device called the imagination station to make it work. And how 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 does that all how does that make all it feel real? Right. Make it feel real. Wouldn't wouldn't that be cool if this thing really existed and how and 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 could do this? Could do what we want it to do. Could do for Digger Digwell. To do for everybody what's doing for Digger Digwell. And and then and then of course viscerally it does because you're listening to these episodes and you're you are the character that's going in. Whoever the kid is, you're following that kid, and that ends up being you, and you experience it in your in your head with the imagination and you're providing the visuals of course but we're providing the soundtrack and and all that's all that's really important all that's really really good um but but i look at scripture when we're telling these stories and i think that's 
that for me is proof of how profound scripture really is because even when we're just doing a, a really kind of surface job of it yeah know, we're just doing the story we're just doing, you're just, just doing so, the story but you're trying to make it real all all the profundity of the story yeah. still comes in in, in yeah. it anyway yeah it, it's there just just in the telling of the story all that still happens all of it still occurs all of it is brought along and and that's the beauty of doing those kinds of of scriptural stories and then of course, what you want to do is recognize that as a storyteller yourself, as a person who is a, is a living, walking, talking story, and you want to say, okay, now, uh, if that's if that's the greatness of story, which it is, then we need to uh, imitate that in our own lives, in our own stories, in the stories that we tell. So, how can we uh, how can we inculcate our stories with that kind of depth? Well, in order to do that, we have to understand what that depth is. We have to understand right. at least an inkling of what that depth is. What is it that we're trying to say here? What is it we're, that we're trying to do? And what is it that that story is trying to tell us? How, how is that story trying to work on, on us? And what can we draw from that story that may not be the main theme of that story, but certainly does help me in a different situation? Um, and, and then how can I take that kind of situation and say, okay, now I'm going to put that into my own stories. Now I'm going to try to put all of that stuff into my own stories. And, and you work and work and work hard. And this was something that it took me a long time just as a, as a, as a story creator to try to, to try to figure out. I couldn't, um, I, I had no interest early on in, um, in what it, in, in the thinking that went into certain pieces of art. You know, I I didn't really think about that. I was just I was just experiencing them on a visceral level, and then what does this make me feel? What does this make me? How do how do I feel? Do I turn it sure. on? Do I turn it off? And whatnot. And I never had any kind of interest really in saying, but why do the artists do that? Mm. Why why are they doing that? How come right. they're how come they're how come they did that thing at that time? More experimental than yeah, uh, why, than why? than craft. And and the first time I started actually thinking about it was watching the movie Shane. Okay. And if you've ever seen the movie Shane, then you realize one of the things that happens in Shane, the the, the story of Shane is a gunfighter who gunfighter who is trying to redeem himself. Basically, he's trying okay. to go reform himself. And there's a little boy in the in the film, and um, at, at one point in the in the in the film, the um, the gunfighter uh, has his gun on and. Uh, he fires it. He, he shows what it's like to do a fast draw. And he fires the gun. And the gun, the sound the gun makes is um, extraordinarily loud. It's out of place loud. Mm. It's, almost, it's almost distorted loud. It's mm -hmm. so loud that you think, did they just make a mistake? Did right. somebody actually bump the volume in the projection? Of, you know, no. did, did they do that? Or something? No, no. That, and that's and then I thought because that's what the first thing I thought. And then you just go on with the story. You don't think about it. But then you see it subsequent times. You realize no, that gun roars. It roars, and you realize well, that's what that's what they intended to do. Yep. Oh well, why? Right. Why, why did he? Why did they do it that way? How come mm -hmm. they did it that way? How come they? How come they framed the shot so that the gun was firing? And in the background, you see the little boy and his reaction to the loudness and the, the terrifying loudness of this weapon and what that really, really means. And it, 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 suddenly it's such a wonderful thing. You start realizing, oh, you know what? I have to do that yeah. in the stories that I write, but I have to think about it before I ever write them. Right. You know, I, I have to I have to intentionally put that stuff in there. There has to be stuff in the stories that I'm intentionally doing right. uh, that may be uh, part of the craft, it's hidden. It's something you're going to have to dig a little bit more, dig a little bit more, dig a little bit more to to get. But it's something that has has to happen. And then, of course, when you when you think about film school and you think about them, I mean, the things that that they don't teach you in film school, but one of the things they should is that kind of intentionality. Yeah. That um, the the great filmmakers of Hollywood history, the you know the Raoul Wal Walsh's and the you know the the people of the John Fords and the, the Henry Hathaways and all those guys who who were there at the beginning, 
knew all this stuff instinctively. And then you think about, well, it's not even instinctive. They just understood the science of it. They really yeah. were there at the creation of this whole art form. And they knew, well, this is where people are going to be looking on the screen at any given time. And this is why we do the things that we do. And this is the art direction that I need. How do I visually show that these two people are soulmates? Right. How would I do that? How, what would I do? How would I do that? And and then you, and then then you can start seeing it and picking it out in later films. Right. So one of the great examples of this, of course, is uh, is uh, Casablanca. Mm -hmm. There's a great scene in Casablanca, and it's the scene where it's just after the scene where Rick uh, is drunk and he's he insults Ilsa and, and she leaves and everything. And then the next morning he goes, she's out in the bazaar and she's trying to buy stuff, and he sees her there and he walks up to her and he wants to apologize to her. And you and you look at the scene and and you're you're seeing the interplay between the two of them. She's very cold and he's he's trying to apologize. He's trying to you know I was drunk and I didn't I shouldn't have been done doing the same. Then you notice certain things about the scene. The more you watch the film, the more you notice certain things about the scene, and you realize oh what is it that that's making the scene special? These two people are dressed almost identically. Mm -hmm. She has a kind of same kind of uh, hat that he has. She's got. A, a scarf on that's the same kind of tie that he has on. She's wearing a a, a, a lapeled coat and he's wearing a lapeled coat. You know, they're they're almost dressed identically. And when you look at this, you realize these two people are soulmates. Yeah. They're supposed to be together. And the tragedy of the movie is they're not going to be together. Right. You know, <laughs> which is which is wonderful because it works on you subconsciously you realize no these two people belong together these two, even though they're mad at each other in the scene they still belong together right and, and then the tragedy the great tragedy the heroic tragedy the wonderful thing that rick does is sacrifice his own wants for the greater cause right and that's what makes it so really wonderful that's that's what makes this otherwise kind of sappy b movie into a great work of art right suddenly we realize oh man there's something much deeper going on here well, if you look at the Harry Potter films, people should see the Harry Potter films. If you look at the Harry Potter films, they use that same device. Ron and Hermione dress identically as they get older. They wear the same kinds of t-shirts. They wear the same, they, they put they, their hair is kind of fixed the same way. They do the same kinds of things. They, Ron, they're, 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 you're getting the feeling that they're putting them together. They're putting, they're supposed to be together. These two people. And Harry's the binder. And yeah. Harry's the binder, yeah. which is really, so it's, it, it, and then you, that's when you start thinking, okay, in my own stories, I've got to start doing that kind of thing too, which means I've got to think it through. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's a, there's a, there's a time and a place for just writing randomly, just putting stuff down and getting stuff down as much as you possibly can. But that should only be the start. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, you go back and you say, what, I have to think this through. I can't just make it this thing that, Oh, I, you know, I got inspired and I wrote and it. And this is not to be a perfectionist. That's the other thing. It's not, no, it's not. It's not to be a perfectionist. It is to be a great storyteller. Right. That's the key. That's the key. And this is what I try to teach people in my course. I try to teach them that this is not about perfectionism. There is that aspect of things, but this is not what we're talking about. What we're talking right. about is intentionality. Yep. The intentionality of the artist. Intentionality. What are you trying to say? Everything that's going to be, you're going to see, you're going to hear, you're going to read in this story needs to be there for a reason. It's got to be a reason. There needs to be there for a reason. It doesn't have to be a deep reason all the time, but it's better if it is. Yeah. And you need to think it through. You, you need to know what's going on here. You need to think it through. Um, it has to be motivated. There has to be that kind of moment to it. And then you have to think in terms of great themes that you're trying to get across. You're trying to tell people and get across. And that's why we love the Chronicles of Narnia. That's why mm -hmm. we love the Lord of the Rings. That's why we love these kinds of epic tales. Uh, and even, even if they're not epic tales, but they have that kind of element in them, that's why we love them. And we go back to them and we read them over and over and over again. I'm currently, I'm currently dealing with this with, um, I've had a, uh, fantasy series i've been working on for some time uh and you know it, i write i you've you've probably seen in my stuff's in rhyme um you know doing the epic epic poetry thing trying to bring it back mm -hmm. um 
but making it accessible that's the big thing you know yeah um yeah. and yeah. and that that's fun um but the fantasy and necessary series, i have to say the necessary yes. the poetry part of that is necessary that's the reason i did the christmas bells episode the one thing i really wanted everybody to understand with with uh with henry wadsworth longfellow is that poetry is the poetry is the transcendent language yes it's how it's it, it, it's a language of transcendency and it's how we it's 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 the highest expression of uh of of a, an ethereal language that we have and see that, doesn't it go unbelievably right. well with cliffhangers oh yeah. i mean i mean the whole point of poetry is you're hanging on to what the next either rhyme or or line or whatever it is that you you have a sense of what it's going to be but you're yeah. not sure what it's going to be and and that's that's one of the, the like it works so harmoniously with with epic poetry anyway yeah. but the point that i was getting at was i have had to I have realized that my biggest failing in my first, you know, stuff going on with this series is um, I have a very big picture of all these sort of semi-continents as what I would call them. They're not really continents. They're either islands or large, you know, pieces of land mm -hmm. um, or whatever the case may be. Um, and even some of the towns in these, uh, semi-continents but they are um uh outside of that i've just kind of been making stuff up as i go and i could do that for a little while but the problem that i ran into is um and i have an idea of where they're going and where they're going to end up but this is a very journey based story mm -hmm. there's a lot of walking compared to other stories that i do a lot of you know moving transporting whatever you want to call it in various ways and i realized that i can't do the star trek thing oh we're zipping around to this planet oh we're zipping around to that planet it just <laughs> doesn't work in fantasy um and so i've had to go in and go hard on world building in a way that and, and i and i've hammered it into myself that it's not selfish to do you aren't wasting time as long as you are actually making things that you intend on putting into the story yeah <laughs> you know yeah. um yes. and 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 that's that's the big thing or or will be referenced in your story let's just well i way. you know let me let me add an addendum to that though i think that it's possible for you to do a lot of world building Mm -hmm. that never does appear in your story right but it's still important for you to know it right yes still and that, but that's a referential to, to yeah. the writing right yeah. it's not always yeah so like yeah. for what one thing you that have I, you have to know your world yes like god knows this one the this that's, world that's the the, the gimmick so to speak of this world if i can use such a lame term um is that music is magic and magic is music literally um the fluctuation of keys is the main form of magic in the world there is also silent magic but that is considered like you know secondary and 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 uh yeah. evil yeah. um but the because of that and this is just an example for people listening of like what you said something that's referential but i may not go into it is i had to think you know um a lot of weapons are combined with musical instruments in this world yeah um and as a result i had to think of what materials these uh uh would be the best materials in this world to create said instruments um some would okay. need to be impact resistant some would need to be able to bend better um and then there are certain ones that are like head and shoulders have better effects than like your standard wood your standard you know uh sheep gut your standard you know et cetera right. et cetera right, right. and right. and i had to create animals that the sheep gut would come from i had to you know yeah. go into those that kind of detail yeah because that will be referenced in the yeah. story, yeah. but, but it's, it's, yeah. So that's, that's the kind of thing, but it's, well, it's, and, it, yeah. and the, the thing about it is, the thing about that is uh, uh, you're doing the research, which right. is an incredibly important tool mm -hmm. and you're asking the right questions. So, and you realize once, once you do this, especially, this is especially true with world, world building, 
you just did it. You walked down the path. So, right. okay, if, if, if that's the case, if music is magic and magic is music, then the instruments have to be special and they have to be of different types. And, and what you just did, look at how you walked down the path. Well, that means that they can't all be made of the same wood. Right. You know, and if they're, and if the magic is also a, uh, weaponized, then some of them are going to be different than others. Some of them are going to have to be used differently than others. Some of them are shields. Some of them are right. attack weapons. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, okay. If I get, if I use, um, stringed instruments and the string is also a bow, mm -hmm. what kind of string would that be? Well, okay. Maybe it's the guts of sheep. That's fine. And but it would have to be tunable. Really sheep? Yeah. Is it something mm -hmm. else? Is right. it something that's even a better animal or a different kind of animal? And, what would that be? And then, and now you're going to have to figure out the, you know, the whole history of that animal, where that came right. from. I mean, that's, it just leads to, to more and more and more and more questions that you have to know. Yeah. You really do have to know it. And, mm -hmm. and uh, if, because if you don't, if it's not authentic, then everybody's, everybody's meter, everybody's BS meter. I say, well, everybody yeah, has a BS absolutely. meter. Absolutely. It mm -hmm. goes bing, 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 uh, you mm -hmm. know, Yep. it doesn't make it i've heard so many stories from young writers um who want to place their story in a certain location a city or a country and mm -hmm. it's evident that they've never been there before right and it's evident not only that they've never been there before but they didn't bother to google a map of the city or look at pictures on uh, pinterest <laughs> or, just, or just look at a picture uh, yeah. yeah, look at a picture of it on Pinterest and fig figure out what the city looks like and where, where where it would be and what's going on. And it's even worse when you actually live in the city that they're trying to describe. It yeah, they've never been there before. Yeah, you know, I just read I read somebody a, a story that somebody had submitted and and uh, they were talking about uh, um, <laughs> they were talking about Los Angeles LAX International mm -hmm. Airport and um, they had people landing in a certain terminal. Um, and they were making the story beat out of the fact that they were landing in a certain terminal. And I said, what's in that terminal? Right. What airlines go to that terminal? Right. And then they went and they found out it's something like, you know, three obscure airlines, Air Israel and, you know. It wasn't a Alaska, good choice. Alaska yeah. Airlines. And I was right. like, there's no way that anybody would fly into that terminal from right the location that you're having your characters fly and see this is a lot of and, people and, think and they can just real simple, yeah i know it's yeah. a real simple thing i i know the reason why this writer did this he wanted a joke he right. wanted to make it into a joke but i'm like mm -hmm. well no it's not i mean right. you have to lax is a real place right and if it's a real place then air, people have been through it before right and if they've been through it they're going to know that's not where people go from right. this location to this location. And you've ruined your joke. Right. Exactly. Okay? You've ruined yeah. your joke. You've, you stomped on your own joke because you didn't do a little bit of research. Right. So all you and, have to do is the research. And a lot of people think they can get by on fantasy or sci-fi or whatever else with this sort of thing. But the thing that, you know, I think is pretty clear here is um, if I just said, you know, uh, uh, it, and it can be a joke. You can do it a little bit more smoothly. Like Odyssey has had various maps, I'm sure, over the years, and none of oh, them are super consistent. But the fact is, um, we know that Finneman's Market is a thing, and we have a yep. general idea of what Finneman's Market is. There's a concreteness to Finneman's Market. Yep. Um, we uh, we know what Wit's End is very clearly. We know what you know. Um, the the uh, I think the the one that kind of stands out to me though that's and, and this isn't me ragging on it in any way, but the one that uh, I hear more people say I just have no concept of this place is the electric palace just because there's been so many different kinds of electronic stores over the years I think yeah, yeah um I was yeah. kind of pictured as radio shack but you know that's that's uh, not my picture. I, I I I think a clue as to what kind of store the electric palace is comes um would come from its uh, its owner <laughs> okay just think about him for a minute and think okay if you think about him for a minute the kind of person that he is you then you, you'll figure out very quickly i think what kind of a store it is and how it's laid out you know i mean it's <laughs> yeah, bart that's true. We're that's say. True. is bart consistent in anything that he does no <laughs> he's not that's true that's true he's he's not he's a he's a you know he's 
he's our version of Peter Griffith. He's our, you know, our version of Homer Simpson. He's, he's not, he's, he he's an the, algorithm chaser. He goes the easy <laughs> you know? route and everything. Yeah. He is a typical, I mean, if you're going to look at, if you're going to look at an archetype, he is the, the, let's take the easiest route possible. Mm. Um, let's do the easiest. He's that kind of person. That's, yeah. that's what motivates him. The easiest route possible. And it always gets him into trouble. Right. You know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the irony of that kind of lifestyle. If I take, if I always look for the easiest route possible, do the, the littlest amount of work, fewest amount of work to try to get the most, gain the most money, um, it's always going to end up into a, in a disaster. And, and that's exactly who he is. So think about that for a second. And you'll understand how cluttered <laughs> and what a, what a mess this store really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and rightfully so that's okay. That's all right. That's what it's supposed to be. So now it's I'm funny. picturing Radio Shack with a basic cement floor and um, instead of the carpet and just I, you know, boxes I, I, everywhere and tons of signs. Lots I grew up in the, I, I, I grew up in the era before <laughs> Radio uh, Shack before well before malls yeah. and before before mini malls and stores yeah. like that where it was just a store this a standalone store by mm-hmm. itself and it was filled with stuff right you know you usually you could find a uh, walgreens were these kinds of stores where you just had it was just stuff there was all sorts of stuff everywhere and there was really no rhyme or reason to where anything was it was just a lot of stuff and 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 there was somebody in the store who knew where everything was and that was the go-to person so Mm -hmm. i need this oh you'll find it back there behind that over there along that 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 aisle and and uh, and then there were other people who knew various <laughs> in varying degrees where things were. Right. But then if they didn't know something, they would ask the they would ask the guy who knows where everything is. Right. Right. Where is it? And that's that's kind of what I envision. I see that. Yeah. Palace being, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's just this place that's brightly lit, place that has uh, signs everywhere, stuff hanging from the ceiling, um, and it's cluttered with stuff. There's lots yeah. of stuff. And that way, you know, Bart can always get away with charging people different prices that are listed. Mm-hmm. You know, he you promise him, say, oh, I want to buy this, and uh, you know, it's a different price in the cash register. You say, well, your sign says this. He goes, oh no, that's the sign for something else. Right. That's not that. That's not the sign for. But it's on that. Yeah, but it belongs over there. Right. You know? I mean, that that's all he has to do in order to be able to do what 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 he uh, what he wants. Yeah. So, well, uh, taking it back to Wedding of Cana to kind of get toward wrapping. Um, on the previous show that I did with Jason Farley, I've done two with him now. Um, we talked about the early Celtic church, um, which was an excellent topic and we had a really good time discussing it. Um, one of the big things that I really wanted to bring up with him that was really cool. And he, he kind of delved into it. Um, have you read any Stephen Lawhead by any chance? Uh no i haven't i've i've um uh, seen the name yeah i ha- i've i've seen i've i've seen the book i perused them but i haven't really delved into them i haven't okay. really read them so i i can't really speak to them there's them, but... there's one series that came out in the 90s called the song of albion that is one of my favorites i actually put it uh up there alongside um uh narnia rings and uh wing feather saga by andrew peterson I'm yeah. not sure if you're familiar with that one. Are they making um, that into an animated yes, series? Yes, right yes. You've been seeing the the stuff on that, yeah, which I'm right excited now. about that. That's a yeah. really good story. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the uh, the thing that was really cool, we kind of delved into, you know, with the kind of Melchizedekian meta narrative sort of thing that I had mentioned earlier. Right. Um, Jesus is individually king of not just you know jews and not just universal but there are certain things in the pagan prophecies that were very obviously telephone gamed from noah on down through the years to the celts where jesus was perfectly fulfilling the role of the high king of ireland and many other places and song of albion goes into that and one of the people that we talked about from that period and this kind of ties in with the wedding of Cana that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, St. Bridget, are you familiar with her? Okay. She was, um, we actually get the word bride from her name. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. She, uh, but she was never married. 
And uh, she oh, was, one of those great ironies. Oh, yeah. And um, the reason why uh, we got the word was because people began to say over time, I need a Bridget. Um, yeah. And uh, give you a kind of an idea of the kind of woman she was. She was an abbotess. You know, she, yeah. she, she really served people. Yeah. And she wrote this prayer poem that I really wanted to read to you. Okay. Um, and we can, you know, talk a little more after as far as like whatever, anything you want to cover before we go and then wrap it up. But I wanted to specifically bring this to your attention before the end. Okay. Um, this goes like this. This is obviously translated, but it, you can hear the, the Irish poetry in there. Um, I would wish a great lake of ale for the King of Kings. I would wish the family of heaven to be drinking it throughout life and time. I would wish the men of heaven in my own house. I would wish the vessels of peace to be given to them. I would wish joy to be in their drinking. I would wish Yesu to be out here among them. I would wish the three Marys of great name. I would wish the people of heaven from every side. I would wish to be a rent payer to the prince. The way if I was in trouble, he would give me a good blessing. I would like the angels of heaven to be among us. I would like an abundance of peace. I would like full vessels of charity. I would like rich treasures of mercy. I would like cheerfulness to preside over all. I would like Jesus to be present. I would like the three Marys of illustrious renown to be with us. I would like the friends of heaven to be gathered around us from all parts. I would like myself to be a rent payer to the Lord that I, that should I suffer distress, that he would bestow a good blessing upon me. And there's other variations on the poem that have other, you know, takes on what she's saying. One of my favorites here is um, I'd love the heavenly hosts to be tippling there for all eternity. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I just, you know, thinking of that, thinking of the wedding of Cana, um, you know, it, and thinking of serial storytelling, taking it back to our initial topic. Yeah. I just have this sense that in order for me to write something that is as real as I can possibly get it as a, a, a mortal in this body, you know, and have a new body coming, mm -hmm. um, the, the best way that I can imitate reality is through serial poetry that only ends if my children don't continue it uh well yeah and and that's that's my goal you know <laughs> well so. You, so what so the question that i would have for you is what steps are you taking to make that a reality well one obviously is reading the stories to my children sure uh, as far as the stories themselves and the way that I'm publishing, um, I am actorish as, as you can tell I'm, you know, whatever as much, but I don't like acting in stuff as much, although I would, especially for you, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, I like telling the whole story. Yeah. I like being the storyteller yeah. and, um, the, uh, the, the thing that I'm doing currently is I have a sort of system where I am publishing through all these short video platforms that have popped up. They're perfect for individual poems. And I am tying them together through visuals uh, and through hashtags to where you can start at chapter one and keep going. Mm -hmm. And immediately be, by looking at it, and seeing one or two of them, you realize this is part of a bigger narrative. This is part of a right. bigger whole. Right. And um, you want to know what happens next. You get hooked into one and then you go back to chapter one and you keep going. Also, with all these short platforms, you have all these entry points. You can enter at any chapter because of all mm -hmm. these algorithms. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's using the advantages of this sort of platform for short form to bring people into a more long form. And I'm having some success with it. It's slow, Good. but it Good. is consistently growing. Well, I, I think my question was more pointed toward your kids. Yeah, I was going to get to that. <laughs> yeah. As far as my kids, you know, I'm teaching them by by reading the stories and 
and and talking to them about the characters my 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 daughter knows some of my superheroes that she's too young for even already um and she pretends to be them already she's four uh my son is one year old um and i sing some of the ones that are i mean you write poetry eventually you're gonna you're gonna write some songs too sure, so sure. uh some of them are songs and he knows and can you know in his broken pronunciation sing along with some of them um and my daughter tends to be more of an archiver and scholarly scholarly type already um and that wasn't by intention but that seems to be her purpose she's very very um specific in moving things around and i believe at this point in life that that's probably where things are going to go is more with her but my son surprises me every now and then too and we're hoping to have more children too so sure as far as all that goes if i pass at any point everything passes to my wife that's that's in in the works um and my hope and my goal for all of them through uh letters that i'm writing to them for when they're older and other things of that nature is to basically tell them you know no pressure you have your own life and have to do what's right before god but um i spent all this time building this for you and for your children well, here's you know? <laughs> here's the thing uh, that I'm, I'm sure you've considered and you thought about but um maybe maybe not i don't know um, yeah you 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 said it earlier in the conversation your dad yeah what did your dad do for you yeah yeah i'm doing that <laughs> okay and, yeah. and that's that's really the key here for us to pass this on to that's to right future generations it's that's the the <sighs> Our children. You asked about love... the stories. I, I tried to keep it on topic, but yeah, I, it's you know, all part I, of it. But it's all part of it. It's all yeah. part of it. Our children will love what they see us loving. That's right. They will. Yep. And we don't have to. We don't have to force it down their throats. We just have to be passionate about what we are passionate about. About the ideas that we uh, um, that we love and, and yeah, and that... think of. And that's that's the key to get them to love scripture too. That's the key to get them to loving all of this. Um, we 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 think that we have to force it on them. We have to continually force it on them and force it on. That's the sure way to get them to reject right. it if we keep forcing it and forcing it and yes. forcing it. Yes. But if they see my dad loved the movie, it's a mad, 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 mad world. Right. I watched him laugh until he nearly threw up all mm -hmm. the you know, and he would every single time he would watch it, he would laugh and laugh and laugh. My dad had asthma and he would laugh himself into an asthma attack yeah. almost every single time he That's funny, it. my dad had asthma attacks from laughing too. <laughs> and I uh at first didn't understand that movie at all mm -hmm. when I was really little, but I well, laughed, laughed because anyway. He was laughing. Yep. I laughed because he was. Mm -hmm. It was whatever dad was laughing, it must be funny right okay i'm gonna laugh i'm gonna laugh on and then as i grow I grew older and i began to understand just why this was funny you know then i started laughing because uh, the, i i really enjoyed the film itself but yeah to this day when i watch it um there's a big part of me that laughs at stuff and i laugh uproariously at it because my dad laughed at it right you know and, and my I, parents my parents took me to church they wanted me to be a, a christian a christian man. so from the day i you know almost came out of the womb we were at church we were at church all the time i have a christian heritage on both sides of my family mm -hmm. um a, a long long christian heritage on both sides of my family and and so part of it was you know familial pride that we you come from the your ancestors right. with, with this guy and that guy and this person and that person and we are and christians we, are, we yeah. are christians and this is what we do um, and so part of it was that, but part of it was also, I saw how much they loved it. They, yep. they took it seriously. They loved yep. it. And, uh, and it was part of who they were. And, uh, and that gave me a sense of belonging and it gave me, there's a, there's a great scene in Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter book where he goes into the mirror of Erised and, and he just stares there and he sees his mother and father, but in the, in the book, they don't do this in the movie, but in the book. He sees not only his mother and father, but behind his mother and father, he sees other people, and they kind of have his look to them. Some, right. some of them have his eyes. This guy, that guy back there has his nose. That guy over there has his ears and his hair and this and that. And then he just sees hundreds of them going all the way back, way, way, way back. 
And you realize, oh, my goodness, he's looking at his entire family history. His loving context. He's looking, he's looking yeah. at so great a cloud of witnesses. That's exactly yeah. the thing I thought mm -hmm. was so great a cloud of witnesses. And they're looking all at him. And they're yep. looking at him and smiling. Yeah. And looking at him. And they're like, this is love. And we approve of you. And we are so proud of you. Right. Yep. And it, it's like, wow, when you have that, how could you not love? Like, and that, if we can capture that and give that to our children, oh, that's such a wonderful thing. Such a wonderful thing. I have a a talk that I'm, I have a version of it on YouTube, but I'm working it to be able to talk at conferences eventually. Um, and it's called Be Your Family's Bard. And there that is, and that is my tagline. Uh, you're going to hear me close with it in a second. I've been working okay. on my tagline for a while, but the, um, this is the first time I've done it. I've done it several times since we last spoke, but yeah, I mean, to me, being your family's bard includes telling them the gospel, the truth of the story. That's the primary thing. The secondary things are making the, uh, cultivating their imagination to love the truth as beautiful right yes. not just as true but as beautiful right yes, yes. um and then yes. the other the other thing is um actually telling them their own story which is giving them the context of their family heritage what point we are at in the story not just as an individual as a family but also as a world yeah. And giving them the context for what their character is and where you see them going, know, knowing full well, you're not a prophet, you know, in, old, in the Old Testament sense, but you are prophetic to them in that you have to help them see this context as part of your job as a father, a mother, even a brother or sister, you know, an yeah. older brother or sister. And my yeah. whole thing is no matter who you are, no matter what your family looks like, you know, um, it, it, whatever your, your, your familial relations, be your family's bard yeah, and be a bard to your family, right? And be the person who archives and presents the beauty and truth constantly, even when they don't want to hear it. Well, uh, you, know? Uh, uh, you know, that's the objective aesthetic, isn't yeah. it? Um, mm -hmm. Truth, goodness, and beauty truth, goodness, and beauty. And we, we have a tendency to, um, to uh, uh, one last thing here, we yeah. have a tendency to want to compartmentalize those things. So we, we take truth and we put it here and then we take goodness and we put it here. We take beauty and we put it here. And, uh, and, but, but we don't realize uh, this is not, you know, truth, goodness, and beauty pick two. Yeah. You know, this is not that you, you, you have in the objective aesthetic, which is God, in the objective aesthetic, you can't do truth without beauty and goodness. That's right. You can't do goodness without beauty and truth. You can't do beauty without truth and goodness. You can't do them. They're all intricately in, in intertwined. Anything else and is a counterfeit. Anything else is a counterfeit, and and uh, uh, and that's that is that is the objective aesthetic. That is divine art. That is what we all need to be striving toward. Okay, we all have our likes. You like what you like. That's perfect. That's whatever it is. You like what you like. But our, we should be aligning our likes toward the objective aesthetic. We should be aligning our 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 wants, our desires, our likes, our artistry toward that. Yeah. And that way, uh, and people think, oh, it's so so limiting. You're limiting everything. Uh, that means you just want me to write Bible <laughs> stories. Well, first of all, what's wrong with writing Bible stories? Again, Ain't nothing wrong with writing Bible that. stories. Well, We'll you can pull, even do it with vegetables now. We'll, just... pull this, well, we'll pull this back around to what we were talking about before. Bible stories are pretty, pretty exciting stuff. That's they're right. pretty, pretty good. You know, we've just we've just turned them into boring things, but they're really good, really important right. and, and good things. But the second thing is, no, look at the look at the wonderful things that are wonderful stories that we love that are out there, the classics that we keep coming back to. Look at the Lord of the Rings, the Chronicles of Narnia. All of these kinds of the you know science fiction trilogy, all of these kinds of, of books, and then you start seeing great art, even in things that are not meant to be that way, even in things that really don't go in that direction or would not be the author would not identify with that kind of a, a aesthetic objective uh, or objective aesthetic. It's it's uh, uh, again you can pick this stuff out of Harry Potter, 
You can pick this stuff out of Star Wars. You can pick this stuff out of uh, of, of any of the Marvel comics. You can pick this stuff out. The thing that everybody goes back to, the most, most profound thing of all the Marvels, you know, if you had to, you had to pick one thing that everybody's going to remember, that's the most profound thing of all the Marvels is with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. Everybody knows that line. Everybody knows that line. Everybody picks that one. The Spider-Man story is so compelling because that's what Uncle Ben tells Peter Parker. Yeah. With great power comes great responsibility. And that's yeah. the line that everybody goes to. Everybody knows right from the beginning. And it's an incredibly profound line. Yeah. And it's part, it's, that is a, a, an eternal truth. That is an eternal truth. Now, we're not going to say that, that Spider-Man is a Christian story by any means. But boy, it has that great element at the heart, at the heart yeah. of it. That great Christian element at the heart mm -hmm. of it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And we start picking things like that. Well, that's that's aligning our sensibilities our likes to our imaginations objects, our imaginations our creativity our storytelling our what 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 we do our lives as story we're aligning this or aligning it with the objective aesthetic we're aligning it with god with truth goodness and beauty we're aligning it and everybody says well yeah but that's just not you want pollyanna you know you want these rebecca of sunny brook farm no truth is frequently ugly that's right Truth is frequently ugly. It's the mm -hmm. hardest of the three. It's the hardest of the three. It shows the underside of nature, it's, and it shows the rebellious part. Truth is the one that, that 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 is rebelled against of those three all the time. Nobody likes truth. Nobody. Mm -hmm. and they but they will attack everything, beauty everything and they goodness can, to get to it. Everything they can to, mm -hmm. to destroy it, to destroy yep. truth. And yep. that's where the ugliness of the stories come in. That's where you can really grip grip it but you have to understand how that how this whole thing works right all of these are integrated they cannot be done one cannot be done without the other and mm -hmm. by the way that's the same same thing uh with the fruit of the spirit yeah you can't you don't just have love compartmentalized and then joy compartmentalized and then this compartmentalized and that compartment you know you don't have that no you have all of them together they all go together the fruit all salad of, of the spirit of life. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it is it, it is it's a mix together it's like a fruit yep. smoothie of the spirit even. yeah it's all yeah mixed together mm -hmm. all mixed together and you can't do one without the other and when you try to do one without the other that's when we fail right yeah that's when things go bad wonky and get worse yep um, so all right that's it, that's it. well I'm going to wrap and then I'm going to tell you the thing that I remember from way earlier and then we can roll. Okay. okay. <laughs> Everybody be your family's bar. Do not turn to the right or to the left and the Lord will be with you wherever you go. We will see you all next time in the trenches on Poets at War. God of song said, Lord.